their favourite beakers. I'm going to actually invite Pete and Jen to come and have a quick hello. You never forewarn people because then they worry about it. But Pete and Jen Klen are um, from Perth and they've been ministering in Canada with the Anglican Church. They're now part of the... You tell me. You tell the story. Should be on. So we left Perth uh, nearly 20 years ago to go to school for a couple of years, raise our kids in Canada and God intervened and we ended up staying and uh, so during school it was at school where I felt called to do pastoral ministry and um, thought that the idea of being a charismatic spirit filled Anglican church would be pretty inspiring and so I got ordained as an Anglican pastor and uh, the Anglican church in Canada is very very secular it's really liberal they sort of celebrate land rights for gay whales and everything in between it's and um, except for Jesus so in 2007 Jenny and I resigned from the Anglican Church of Canada and made a stand for the gospel we believe anyway and uh, the very next day I received a license from the Anglican Church of Rwanda and uh, so we were licensed by the Anglican Church of Rwanda to bring the gospel to North America and we now belong to what's called the Anglican Mission, a group of churches throughout Canada and the USA that have been licensed by Africa to bring the gospel to North America. And so you could say we're sort of Aussie African missionaries in Canada. <laughs> I just want to say it's such a privilege and a pleasure for us to be here because we were in the youth group at Co Como Uniting, like, I don't know, in the late 70s. And um, so now our kids get to have Phil as his pastor, their pastor. And to us, it's like, it's just awesome. That's just kingdom. Like, that makes me want to cry. So thank you. Thank you for what you've been doing. And I should say, because I'm a pastor and we, we planted a church five years ago um, just south of Vancouver in British Columbia, Western Canada, and uh, our folks will be worshipping now. We're just a smaller group of about 50 people, but I send you greetings on behalf of All Saints Community Church. Bless you. Pete and I both agreed earlier on we won't tell stories about yesteryear. It's today that matters. But it was wonderful to see these guys saved and filled with the Holy Spirit way back then in the youth group days. And then to see their kids coming into the Lord, getting filled with the Holy Spirit and all wanting to serve God. Transgenerational church, eh? Amen. You and your household. Some are a bit slower in coming than others, but you and your household got to believe it, declare it, and hold on to that promise. So that's fantastic. Great to have you here. And Jen can sing. I mean, she can sing. He can't. <laughs> she can sing. And Dal, if the, if the inspiration falls on you, halfway through the sermon, I don't care, just sing very much a powerful healing flow that comes out of her spirit when she sings. Anglicans for Jesus. Yay. <laughs> Seems an irony to have to say it, doesn't it? But that's a good story that Africa is now sending missionaries into America to make sure the true gospel gets preached. It's not that there aren't many already preaching, of course, but this is another whole battalion joining rank and beating those forces of liberalism and modernism and telling the devil with his compromise to bow his knee to the gospel. Fantastic. Great to have some fr friends here, YWAM friends. And I guess you're from the nations as well, are you? I know one is. Where are you from, Dal? Uh, Melbourne. Oh, from Melbourne. Yay! <laughs> that's, a, that's a different breed. That's all right. <laughs> from the West Indies prior. Her parents are from the West Indies. That's, that's a great answer. I love it. <laughs> 
it's a long way over the Nullarbor. It's a different road. It's a different race. And Dallin, from? I'm from the United States. Pennsylvania. Great, fantastic. Ireland, yeah. It's a great day for the Irish. It's a great, sorry, and Dal, from Canada. There you are. Awesome. Just have a chat. Don't worry about us. Just, we'll wait. Fantastic. Yeah. I'm in Melbourne. That is great. That's classic. That's really classic. I love it. Fantastic. God is good all the time. God is good. Luke 15. Oh, Jesus. You know, there ought to be something deeply satisfying about coming to fellowship. When the church meets together, it really should be very satisfying. And sometimes that's a decision we have to make, is, you know what, I'm going to really press in today. I'm going to get hold of God. Otherwise, it just becomes another meeting, and, you know, we may not even meet with the Lord. Fancy having a meeting and not meeting with Jesus. What's that all about? But when the living stones come together and meet with Jesus, then everything changes. The atmosphere changes. The anointing begins to destroy yokes and demonic attachments flee in terror and we rise up in faith and we might have sort of hobbled in, but we march out ready to take on the world. Really, that's the, the reason why God said, just, it is good to get together. You know, you don't have to be compelled by outward circumstances, but the desire of our heart, living stones, building a habitation for God in the spirit, two or more gathered, and then Jesus arises in the midst. And he speaks and teaches and leads and guides and heals and delivers. It ought to be deeply satisfying. I, I make that decision usually on a Saturday night. Tomorrow's going to be deeply satisfying. It's not out of compulsion that I come, but Lord, I'm going to meet with you and your people. And something happens in your spirit and something happens in your soul. Even your body can be strengthened and invigorated and healed and so on. Just thought I'd drop that in. There ought to be good reason why we come. Okay, Luke 11. This is a scripture that we're all fairly familiar with, I think. <coughs> call it the prodigal son, but probably more accurately call the loving father. And You know, as we're heading into revival, the passion for Christ on the inside of our heart, the passion for souls, uh, God knows how to lead us. And it was wonderful this morning that we humbled ourselves and raised our hand and said, God, lead us. We haven't been this way before. We know how to do church, but we don't know how to do revival. Lead us, God. He's leading the body of Christ into a full-blown revival. It's going to be similar to Acts chapter 2 in the sense of we'll all be thoroughly filled, saturated with the Holy Spirit. The drunken glory will be back as it was on the day of Pentecost where we're out of our flesh and into the realm of the Spirit and we're going to stay there. That's the normal state of the church. They're not drunk as you suppose. They're just very, very full of the Holy Ghost. That's the normal state of the church. And in fact, it's an attraction to the world. What they hate is the lukewarmness. They hate that cold exterior of religion. They hate that calculating spirit called the religious demon that judges and points the finger and condemns and makes you feel guilty. The world hates it. They've already voted with their feet and their behinds. They don't come to meetings. They don't sit in pews. But we who know there's something greater ahead, we're still pressing in and we're moving on and we're not satisfied to stop on our journey, we're going to go all the way through. Revival's the normal state. What could it look like? Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, Acts chapter 5. That's what it could look like. There'll be elements of all that is the basic foundational truth of revival. Once again, will begin to flow forth. There will be gathering together around apostolic doctrine. They'll, they'll gather together for prayer. They'll gather together for the Lord's uh, Supper, which is more than what we did today, which is a powerful symbolic event. More than symbolic, it really is a real thing. I believe the moment you bless that bread and blood, I think there's, by faith, Christ himself is there. And we can feed on him by faith. And uh, they stayed together for that kind of richness of fellowship 
and uh, yet they were so very, very full of the Holy Spirit. Those elements are going to be back to the forefront, I believe, of God's agenda. So hang in and hold on and press in and don't stop short of all that God intends. Amen. Luke chapter 15 gives us the foundation of how this started for us. He said in verse 11, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And he divided unto them his living. Now, without reading the entire parable, you know the story of the two, the, this prodigal son, how he gathered that which was his, his inheritance, and he took off and he lived his life and he you know, ended up in a mess having spent all his money and having um, his friends come and, and bum off him for that time. And then he, he, he came, he, he began to think about what he left behind. He began to reflect on the father's house. And it says in verse 20, this is where we're going to get to, right from verse 11, imagine we've all read 12, 13, 14, 15, up to verse 20. He began to, to verse 18, I'm going to arise and go to my father and I'm going to say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of the hired servants. Verse 20, and he arose, he came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, ran, fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in thy sight I'm no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, shoes on his feet, bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's eat and be merry, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost but is now found. And they began to be merry. And I'm sure we're familiar with that parable. And the son came to his senses, repentance, he turned around, he said, I'm going home. Now, this has happened to us at our new birth. I believe it happens to us if we backslide, if we move away from God, we come to our senses, we turn around again, we go back to the Lord. The world is about to repent and turn and come to faith because that's what revival is. The overflow of the church is so powerful. Communities have changed, atmospheres are changed and people come to Christ. Hallelujah. But if you can get the enormity of what happened here we would truly all the days of our lives rejoice. Particularly in verse 20, I see a five-fold uh, progressive revelation of God's love, God's forgiveness, God's grace. Verse 20, he arose, the son arose, he came to the father, but when he was a great way off, the father saw him. Number one, God sees. God saw you, God sees us today, God sees the world in sin. And not only does he see us afar off, it says, secondly, he has compassion. The father sees, but he has compassion. He doesn't see with the scene of a natural eye, he doesn't hear with the hearing of a natural ear. He doesn't judge according to what he sees and hears. He, in the depth of his heart, looks, he sees, and immediately has compassion. Now, this has happened to us. God had mercy and grace. He had compassion of us when we were in sin. We were bound. Uh, some were addicted. We were all dysfunctional at some level. And God, rather than judge, he had compassion. He saw and he had compassion. I want you to see this building up because of the power of what is released. And then it says, not only he has compassion, he ran. So we see there is a, a certain um, faith movement from the heart of God ever before we respond to God. He loved us first before we loved him. And he uh, aggresses towards us. He runs towards the human race. He's done that in Christ, left heaven, came to earth, ran towards the human race. He does it to us this morning. His grace is running towards us this morning to see if he can help. And uh, he sees us, he has compassion, and he runs towards us. We don't have to beg God to help us. He's there moving towards us all the time. Secondly, it says that that overwhelming love, that anticipation of running towards him, he fell on his neck. The falling on the neck is a picture of this overwhelming identification of a father's love. It, it's like he covered him with his love. When you fall on someone's neck, and we won't do it this morning, but if I did that to my wife, there would be an overwhelming sense of I am covering her and embracing her. And that's what the father does when he sees us afar off. He has compassion. He runs towards us. He can't wait to cover us. And then when he's got us in the safe place of his covering, he kisses us. What a picture. What a picture. What a truth. If only the world knows that's God. 
Religion doesn't always portray that. Religion has a kind of spirit that the word says in the last days it would be this cold calculating and it's called cold love. It's a stronghold of cold love. It says love but it doesn't show love. Love must look like something to be loved. Love is an action word. Love is not a noun that just describes something. Love is something that it happens. God so loved he gave. Jesus so loved he gave his life. They both so loved, they sent the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave gifts. This whole sense of love looking like something so important for Christians to understand that we might portray that to the world. Fivefold progressive revelation of God's forgiveness this morning. God sees, he has compassion, he aggresses towards, he overwhelmingly identifies with our issue, our problem, he covers us with his grace and mercy and he approves of us in our weakness by kissing us. I don't think we've all always understood that God is attracted to failure, God is attracted to weakness, God is attracted to the problems of men. Do we see it like that? He's attracted to it. We even get that revelation in the old covenant that his eyes are looking to and fro across the earth to see on whose behalf he can be strong. So what does that say? He's looking for the weak. He's looking for the poor. He's looking for the one who says, you know what, I can't work this out on my own. I can't solve this. I don't know what to do now. He's looking that he might be strong and his strength might be perfected in our weakness. Now, once you get that, then we forever will be allowing God to keep ministering his life and love because we are weak. But in him, we're strong. Ephesians 6.10 says, be strong. But it doesn't say you've got to try and be strong. It says, be strong in his strength, in the power of his strength. Let his strength be made perfect in your weakness. In your inability, let his ability come forth. That's why he gets all the glory and all the praise. That's why he's the author and the finisher of our Christian walk. All glory goes to God. All we did was smart enough to turn around and face the Lord. And it says as as the son turned around, he was preparing a speech as, as we have ourselves trying to Say to God, well, God, God, you know, I've sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you and I've sinned against earth and I've sinned against me and they're starting to wallow in the reality of his condition. And while he's preparing this huge speech, I mean, he is starting to move towards home. He's not running home. He's afraid of the father just in case he's not approved of, that the father doesn't identify with his situation that the Father doesn't overwhelmingly accept him and cover him and kiss him. He's not sure of that. He's hoping that might happen. People aren't sure of who God is even when they start to come to him. The ones we meet on the streets who make their commitments to Christ, they're not sure of God. Had they been sure of God, they would have come a long time ago. But they're sort of hoping he might be kind. They're hoping he might not be the cause of all the problems on the earth. They're hoping he doesn't sit by while terrible things happen as if he's not interested. They're hoping that he might be father-like in the, in the best possible terms. And they're moving towards him with all their feelings of inadequacy and fear and I've sinned and I've made a mess and I, I'm having this baby and... No, I'm not. But, this, but people are, are coming with all this stuff and what religion does very often is point out the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, the stuff, instead of saying, but the Father sees you coming, he's not listening to your speech, he's too busy planning to run towards you, to cover you, to kiss you, and to prepare celebration. He is listening, but that's not his prime focus. He just wants to know that you've turned. And by turning and repenting, he doesn't need the big religious speech. He doesn't need the three-hour confessional. He doesn't need all the things that are justifying where we're at. He says, just come. Just as you are, come. Boom, got us, loves us, kisses us. That's overwhelming. That's overwhelming. While we're preparing speeches of why we've done what we've done and whose fault it was, why we did it and where the change started and who caused the first problem and all this stuff is going on as if we're Christians who are trying to have to work it out in our heads first. He says, just come with all of your heart. He says, I understand it all. And I still love you. Whilst we were in sin, Christ died for us. Now, this is an important foundation this morning. And as we just go on a, a bit further, you'll find out why. If you don't know the depth of his forgiveness for you, 
there is a chance we will not offer the depths of forgiveness to others. If we think that God has not fully forgiven us, we will not have the capacity to fully forgive someone else. That God's forgiveness is complete, it's absolute, it's a done deal, and it lasts forever. The celebration that takes place when you and I are in God, the robe is the, for us the robe of righteousness. In the custom of the day, it was the best robe or the most important robe that each son in the family would have. It was full length. It was the most prestigious covering. It covered everything in in all of its wonderful natural beauty. And it speaks of a position of a son who is accepted in the family. The son who's accepted in the family, he gets this glorious robe that covers him. That's in this is natural cultural uh, picture of the son. You and I also get a glorious robe that covers us. Hallelujah. The robe of righteousness, the free gift of God's grace. Secondly, he was to be given the ring. The ring speaks of authority, the sign of covenant agreement, a sign that you have the family seal, a sign that when anything has to be done legally, you've got the ring dipped in the ink that gives you the authority to stamp it on behalf of all the family inheritance. Hallelujah. He gets the robe. He gets the authority of the Father, who is the Father of all, who gives us the kingdom. And it's a sign of partnership. It's a sign of covenant agreement. It validates our authenticity as believers. It makes us credible in every transaction in the spirit realm. Hallelujah. It's not us. It's the authority of Jesus, stamped in the blood of Christ. Every time we use his name, it it goes through the heavens. They are children of God. They are partners, God and sons. They got authority on the earth. That was the word that um, our brother brought today when he spoke about our intercession. It's a done deal in heaven, but we have the authority to release it on the earth. How awesome is that? So we have the robe. Anyone saying hallelujah this morning? Covered over, fully covered over. When God looks at us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Secondly, we've got the authority, the ring, that picture of one who has the family authority, the family seal. Now, we too are sealed, Ephesians 1 says, with the Holy Spirit, that that's the sure sign that we will get all that's uh, uh, still waiting for us, the fullness of our redemption. And then he had the shoes. uh, For in that season, those in that culture, those who had bare feet were mourning. They were grieving. They had lost their inheritance. They had lost their position. It was a sign that they were removed from their position. Uh, But when uh, the shoes are given, it was a sign, number one, that they're comfortable. Number two, that they had uh, a sure-footedness and balance to walk. They had a confidence and they had uh, the ability to to have victory, to, to enjoy conquest. Comfort, confidence and conquest, a sign that the son now is fully dressed for all the activity of the family. He's got the robe, he's got the ring, and he's got the shoes on his feet. So these are symbolic, but they're very powerful for us as believers today, that the moment you and I came to Christ, the moment we said, Lord, I repent, I turned, I changed my mind, I'm coming in your direction, then God, yeah, he heard us, but he couldn't wait to get hold of us, cover us, save us, give us the robe of righteousness, Make sure we began to understand now who we are and the authority we have and to make sure we're no longer mourning and grieving but we have now put off the sackcloth and we are rejoicing in the kingdom of God. So that to me is an important foundation because I want to build on that and talk about the need for us not only to understand forgiveness but to release forgiveness. In Matthew chapter 6, did that help anyone this morning or just me? I'm blessed. Matthew chapter 6, here we have in verse 9, After this manner therefore pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Verse 12, Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Forgive us as we forgive others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Verse 14, if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. If you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your heavenly Father forgive your trespasses. This is where it becomes a very serious thing. 
we who've received forgiveness need to be able to freely offer forgiveness. Same truth in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, 38. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, verse 37. Luke 6, 37. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you shall be forgiven. Verse 38. Given it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. Shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured to you again. For with the same measure that you measure, it shall be measured to you again. So when God offers full forgiveness, he, we have the capacity to fully forgive. So there's many scriptures talking about forgiveness and the need to let go of unforgiveness. Why do we need to let go of unforgiveness? Number one, it's one of the main blockages of uh, receiving spiritual healing or emotional psychological healing, even physical healing. Sometimes the Lord, particularly those who are maturing in Christ, I found that when we were coming to Christ, that like that uh, honeymoon thing of God just kept pouring out the miracles, pouring out the miracles... But as he began to teach us truth, we became accountable and responsible to walk in that truth. And it's not that the blessings weren't there. They're fully there. The kingdom's ours. But to receive it, we have to align ourselves with the truth that we know. The values of the kingdom have to be internalized so that our spirit and soul has been changed. Spirit's born again. Soul's been restored. And now we're aligning ourselves to receive have you found that, that it's not always as easy once you became more and more mature because God had a greater requiring? This is just character building. Uh, if it became easy, why grow? Why mature? Why bother? Just click your fingers and get a miracle. But I found the more you know, the more you're accountable to apply what you know to stay positioned to receive the miracle. I mean, God gives it. It's all there by the Spirit. But unforgiveness is a blockage and sometimes God allows it to stay there until we recognize it and deal with it. And then we found there's a release. How many can say amen to that? You know unforgiveness is a key. Last week on Wednesday we looked at the spirit of rejection and how that blocks people receiving. And we need to lay the axe to the root of any wrong belief system. And the axe is the word of God. You just need to get the word of God and you need to get the truth and just give that root system a whack. For those who have had rejection... I'm accepted in the beloved. God who saw me afar off, loved me, ran towards me. Give that rejection a whack. It'll take more than one whack, I'll tell you, because the mind still remembers the rejected feelings. So you wake up the next day and you start and feel rejected. God loves me, whack, you put the truth in and you'll find it'll totally be severed and the feelings can start to change. The patterns will start to change. If you're consistent and hold fast the word with confidence. It's the same in the area of um, unforgiveness. Sometimes you may not even feel that you want to forgive. And even when you've done it, you don't feel that you really did it seriously. Because there's a process with forgiveness. And there's stages. The first stage is a legal transaction. It's something that uh, we do because it's truth. God has given us the ability. Jesus has paid the price for sin. And we just need to offer forgiveness. It's a legal transaction. We, we can let it go because the word gives us the power to do it if we agree with the word. But secondly, and the slightly harder thing is, is an emotional transaction. You always start by doing it by faith. You let it go by faith. Let go of the grievance. Let go of the memory. Let go of the attitude. By faith. I don't feel like it yet, but by faith I'll do it, Lord. That's the legal transaction. It's still powerful before God. It's part of an agreement in the spirit realm that they've spoken out and they've declared their forgiveness and they meant it, but they don't feel it yet. So the emotional transaction sometimes tells us you didn't do it. Yeah, I did do it by faith. And my emotions will catch up with this. The emotional uh, transaction, we actually have to release them from our heart, the feelings that are attached to our heart. How do you know whether you're holding uh, unforgiveness? Sometimes you get angry. Oh, could that anger be directed to someone who did something and said something? Maybe. Sometimes we avoid certain people. We don't like them anymore. Oh, you mean in Christian fellowship? Yeah, I mean in Christian fellowship. It all comes out in Christian fellowship. You know why? Because you can't hide anything. The covering's taken off, and here we are naked and hopefully unashamed. But I tell you, it all hangs out. 
The world will cover up a thousand times, cover up, cover up. You and I can't cover up anymore. Oh, blow. You can't do it anymore. Because the light, in the light, you see light. In his light, you see light. In the light, you see light. If you're serious in your walk with God, you can't push it down, you can't cover it up. It's got to come up and out. You've got to externalise the feelings. Whilst it's internalised, it gets toxic. People have got toxic shame, toxic fear, toxic rejection. It's alive on the inside. But I'm not getting in touch with it because there's pain and there's memories and there's thoughts. Well, bring them out, put them in the light. What took 10 years to form can be released in one minute over communion. It's just a case of being honest and bringing it out. So there's the unforgiveness which is released through a legal transaction, unforgiveness with an emotional attachment that needs to be dealt with. How do you know you might have it? Oh, well, there's certain people I don't speak to anymore. Oh, is that right? Is there a problem? I think so. Well, there are some people, and I just get all these just these negative memories, I'm blocking it out and I'm just not thinking of it. You've got a problem. And so if we're honest about these things, we can, you know... And for some of us, I mean, the worst thing is this, I can't remember the first 10 years of my life. Well, I think you've got a problem. There's something there so painful that you've covered over that has gone toxic because it doesn't disappear. The spiritual reality disappears, the penalty disappears... The curse of it disappears. The memory of it remains until it's brought to the cross. Well, how do you know I've got it? Because you avoid certain people and you no longer talk to this family and you no longer have good memories of the last church and you no longer think leaders are trustworthy. And you, Oh, are they problems? Yes, they're problems. See, when revival comes, the transparency factor is absolutely magnified. Because we're holding a holy God in our midst. And we're holding a holy God in the midst of our fellowship. God inhabits, you know, living stones joined together in fellowship is a habitation for God. God dwells. He dwells in a holy place. He dwells in a clean place. He dwells where truth is. He, he, can't, he can't dwell in a festering mess. It's not that he doesn't love us, but it's not a home fit for him. Isaiah says, where's the house you built? Where's the house you built for God? Well, we're building, Lord, and we're getting rid of that which is not good and we're putting the word in so that it's a place for your dwelling. God dwells in a spiritual place that's conducive to his character and his nature just as demons do. Just as demons do. Why do demons dwell close to men? Because they've got atmospheres where it's conducive for their character. If you harbor fear and you don't deal with fear and fear remains, you have built a house of thoughts made of fearful things, and it's a house of thoughts that attracts a demon that says, you've built me a house, yay! What power has a demon of fear who sits on the treetop outside? You think the birds are going to be afraid? You think the car that drives past is going to be afraid? Whilst they're out there, but when they find a home, they come and rest, it says, and in that place they rest... Rest means it's not inactive. It just means they don't have to fight now. They've, they've got a place conducive for their nature. Ew. Yuck. When I heard this years ago, I did some house cleaning real quick. I thought, I'm pulling down that house of wrong thoughts. I'm pulling down that house of wrong feelings. And I'm pulling down the house of wrong attitudes. Then the devil looks and says, I've got nothing there in him, as it says of Jesus. Mm, interesting. Mm, interesting. Oh, Pastor Phil, I'll do what I want. Of course you can, and so can I. But when you've lived with fear, as I did for many years, you get sick and tired of being sick and tired of it. And the day comes, you say, I'm addressing this thing, and I'm externalizing the feelings and the thoughts. The light of God's word's going to swallow it up. I'm getting an axe, and I'm laying it to the root. God is for me. Who can be against me? If God is with me, what does it matter what happens in this life? You lay the axe and the fear starts to go and the love takes its place. Hallelujah. Anyone happy this morning? Otherwise, we find the same patterns with a similar trigger, brings the same response, and it doesn't matter if you're 80 or 90. I've buried people in in their final days of life who strive and kick and swear and blaspheme and scream and, 
and shake the bed with anger and thump their fists. And I'm thinking, what a tragic way to leave this life. And I wonder where they're heading with all of that stuff unresolved. Now, I know that God saves our spirit. So if our spirit's born again, praise God, we're citizens of heaven. But you know, our spirit and soul is intact. The spirit and soul move together. We need to renew our soul. We need to allow the word to wash and wash and wash and wash and change us. Otherwise, the inner conflict causes many people to backslide. They say, you know, I do love God, but I feel this and I feel this and I feel this and the, 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 the conflict is too great for me to walk this way anymore. It's not that they don't even love God. They've got something in their spirit which is truth, but the conflict of a broken soul, the angers, the fears, the jealousies, the resentments, you name it, as long as the list could be, can be stronger if they're not dealt with than the life of the spirit. Why is it is that a prophet from Malaysia came into this country and he prayed for the Australian church. He felt the Lord say, and it's many years ago now, he felt the Lord say the Australian church is anorexic in its spirit. The spirit is withered. It's not strong and robust and powerful, but the soul life of the Australian church is strong. So when the soul is strong, you've got to have programs that satisfy the soul. It's got to be the right sound, the right look, the right chair, the right outfit, the right people. Well, I don't go to that kind of church. Look at the kind of people who go there. That's a, that's a broken soul. That's dysfunction at its worst. And the world says, what's wrong with you people? You say you're converted and you love God, but look at these behaviours. The, the world picks it up. That's all right. We're changing. The world's going to have another look at the church when revival breaks out. and They go, who are these people? This is the manifestation of the sons of God. These people are whole and they're free and they're happy and they're well and they're strong and they have divine health and divine prosperity and they actually love each other. And they embrace the Anglicans. Hallelujah. And they embrace those from Melbourne who's just been raptured. Where's she gone to? There you are, Dom. And... Uh, Well, we know that Melbourne gets raptured before Perth because the Bible says the dead in Christ rise first. <laughs> Sorry. So there are symptoms. There are symptoms that could tip us off that there's something wrong in the area of forgiveness. I don't like them. I don't like that church. I don't like that group. I don't like this. I don't like the neighbour. There's a problem inside. And forgiveness could be at the heart of it. So once we've worked out, yeah, this is what the word says and I agree with that and then the, the feelings, the emotional side can take a bit longer to catch up but it will catch up. And then we have to let go of this, what I see as a very deeper state of uh, unforgiveness where it's now become, you've made a judgment about the situation or about the person. And this leads, and I finish with this, but it's an important area. It leads into a thing called something. It's called bitter root judgments. Anyone heard of that? Bitter root judgments. Where the unforgiveness has been there, it's got toxic, hasn't been dealt with. You see, sadly, there is a law in the spirit called the law of increase. And the law of increase means that the longer something is left unresolved, the more life that thing has, the more it grows. The longer it's left undealt with, the worse it becomes. I mean, that even just makes sense. If it's not dealt with and you're thinking about it more, it's magnifying, magnifying, magnifying more and more and more. And uh, some people find it a bit hard in some areas, maybe all of us, and here are a couple of reasons why it's harder to let some things go. Number one, there's no justice if I just forgive. Well, we have to let go of our desire to judge and seek justice because God is the judge. You see, when you release someone from your personal judgment, you know that God's going to sort it out. God's going to deal with it because God is perfectly just. But whilst you and I want to be the judge and I want to hold on to that judgment that I've made, then I'm going to hold them in bondage. But have a guess what? You hold yourself in bondage. So the law of judging is this. Judge not lest you be judged. For in the measure that you judge, it's going to be judged back to you again. Because you've now released a spirit, the judgmental spirit, but it's attached to you. So in the measure that you've judged, it's going to come back to you because you're still holding on to this thing. 
And in the spirit realm, like attracts like. Like attracts like. Unforgiveness in the heart attracts more unforgiveness. Lust in the flesh attracts more of that, that lustful life. Anger attracts anger. You find that there's an attraction of likes in the spirit realm. That's why we have to move in the opposite spirit. Moving in the spirit of the Lord Jesus, there'll be no attraction for these lesser things because we'll have a much higher life. So people say, I can't forgive because there's no justice. Yes, there is justice, but you and I are not the judge. God's the judge. Secondly, it gives me a sense of power. I don't think we'd verbalise that, but that's how we feel. (laughs) I'm not letting them off the hook. Oh, I'm now the powerful one in the situation. No, actually, it's a sign of terrible weakness. You might think it makes you powerful, but it's a false sense of power, a false sense of control. I tell you, the control spirit, you've got to lay the axe to that thing. It's so prevalent. What is the control spirit? I'm going to get it done the way I want to get it done. And one way or the other, I ain't going to do it. Control. Get the axe. Humble yourself. Make yourself of no reputation. Because it's going to happen anyway, so you may as well make yourself of no reputation. (laughs) When Christian bashing becomes a a national sport, you have to just humble yourself and say, well, okay, for a season, for a season until God raises up the church in glory... Hallelujah, revival. Everyone's afraid of the church because they get what they ask for and there's such power. And if you lie to the Holy Spirit, they cart you out dead from the meeting as in Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, which is a blueprint for revival, by the way, which is why some people say, I don't want revival, I want a church program. I want a church program where nothing happens to hurt anybody. Well, the truth is everyone's getting hurt because no one's getting more of Jesus. But it feels all right for a season until you're sick of the program. The world offers better programs than churches can. They've got more money funding them for better this, better that, better seats, better accommodation, better air conditioning, better this. That's not our number one priority, although it's nice to be comfortable. It's not the number one priority. We've ministered in Africa where they'll stand under a tree for five hours and it's about 48 degrees. No one moves. They just listen to the word of God. The ones who are panicking are the missionaries. You know, give me a Coke, give me a lemonade, give me a drink, give me a wipe down, give me some watermelon, give me a soft seat, give me a bed, give me a... Because we fed our flesh more than we fed our spirit. I know there's a balance in all these things. So obstacles, three of them. No justice. Yes, there is. God will judge. I'm holding power. No, it's a false power. Let it go. And thirdly, it's too painful. And this can be very real. Some people say, I can't let it go. It hurts too much. Now, if that is the case, I'm not just preaching to you, but we're sharing skills with others that we meet, family and friends, people who don't go to churches. These are eternal truths. If someone's got such deep pain, it's probably now because it's attached to a bitter root. And a root of bitterness, according to the book of Hebrews, defiles everybody. That's the problem with bitterness. If it's not dealt with, the anger, the ambition, the envy, the immorality, the hatred, the gossip... Whatever it is, that's a fruit of something that's really bitter on the inside, something that's toxic, something that's just turned turned things into a sourness that will keep coming out of the heart, coming out. It'll keep coming out, and it defiles everybody. It ruins more relationships. It divides churches. It causes strife. So it's it's better to look at the root and say, well, I want to get rid of this root. It's hurting me. It's hurting others. It's separating me from God. So bitter roots are attached to judgment. And as I said before, uh, judging is such a a terrible thing because it links us to the problem and doesn't release us from the captivity. Um, Many scriptures on judgment, do not judge lest you be judged. We bring ourselves into the same kind of harm that we're trying to hold someone else account for. We bring ourselves into the same spirit. See, with the measure you measure, it's measured back. But, but that measure is whatever you're measuring. Praise God, if you measure love, it's measured back in the same plus press down, shaken together. But because of the law of increase, that's the press down, shaken together, running over. The law of increase, if you're measuring hatred or you're measuring unforgiveness or you're measuring uh, um, fear, then it's also coming back. But it's also coming back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. 
is a law of increase. Law of increase is a spiritual law, whether it's negative or positive. That's pretty scary. I don't like that. I'd like to erase that chapter. I don't really want to erase it, but some people get their whitener and whiten out certain things in the scriptures and put red ink under all the good bits. Judge not, lest you be judged. Well, why am I judging? Because I'm hurting. And I'm hurting so deeply, I don't think I can let it go. Yes, you can, by the grace of God. The love goes deeper. His forgiveness is complete. You can bring it out, be honest about it, and say, Lord, this is what it is, and it really hurts, and allow God to heal it up, deliver you from it. Hallelujah. Judge not, lest you be judged. The same area that you judge, I've seen it again and again and again. If you've got a problem with a certain kind of problem and you just keep going for that thing, before long the very spirit of that thing is jumping all over you. Because in the measure that you measure and in the, in the area that you're measuring it, it's coming back. Isn't that incredible? Isn't that incredible? That's why the one who judges their mother or father and says, you know, my mother did this, my mother did this, my mother, the next thing, the, the relationships they're attracting is the same spirit. And people go, how did this happen? This is what I dealt, this is what I had in my family. Now I've got it again. Yeah, because you drew it to yourself. I hate men, I hate men, I hate men, I hate men, I hate men. The next thing, hateful men are turning up. How come? Well, it just confirms my theory. Well, it does confirm the theory because you attracted them by the spirit that you're releasing. In the measure you measure and in the area of what you're measuring, it comes back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Oh, God help us. That's what happens. That's why people on their deathbed can be thrashing around in agony, bitterness, filth. I mean, you'd be surprised what comes out. The inhibitions are down. The feelings have all risen up. They've all been bottled up. And now, seemingly, at the point of eternity, it's things I, I've been shocked. I had this one sweet little old lady that no one knows because it's years ago. And she was, in case of going, oh, yeah, it's probably her. No. And she was, she was just a sweet little old lady until spiritual reality started manifesting on her deathbed and the language. I thought I'd heard it all. I thought I'd heard it all. And the language was directed at my daughter, my sister, my brother, the neighbor. Da, 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 da. And all I thought of, the bitter roots, never been dealt with. And now it's all back on you. And you do your best to intercede and you weep and you say, Jesus, and he's very merciful and he's ready to come and embrace. But he does need the invitation. You know what the invitation is? I came to my senses. I turned around. I prepared a speech of all the things I've done wrong and God's too busy running towards me to put his arms around me, totally covers my sin, kisses me and says, robe of righteousness, all authority is given on the earth to you. Be at comfort and go and have more victories. Our God is a good God. Hallelujah. Our God is a good God. So I think what we should do if we find that there's any unforgiveness in our hearts, get rid of it. How do you do it? By faith. If you don't feel like it, you do it anyway. Feelings will come. Release them from a judgment you've made. What, how do you make a judgment? Well, you just decide what you think about the situation and that's it. That's my judgment. All school teachers are bad. That's my judgment. Because I had one bad episode with one when I was 10. You might say, oh, they're all bad. That's a judgment. And then you'll have a problem with authority all the days of your life because in the measure you've measured, it's now coming back. All neighbours drive you crazy. Well, you're gonna, when the, this lot move, the next lot come and they're probably worse. How come? You attracted them. Yep, the very spirit you've got is drawing that spirit back. Oh, boy. Sobering, isn't it? But it's good for us. We're grown up. We can take it. I wouldn't preach like this at the young people's church, but just it's, we can take it. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, tonight, Lord, that, well, this morning as well, <laughs> that, um, that you're on our side, God. You're on our side, God. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And you only speak to us this way to help us, Lord. And to bring us into revival. We long for full-blown revival. It's the goal, Lord God, so we can then fulfill the Great Commission. Equipped and anointed. So just pray for the one on your left, the one on your right this morning. 
Oh, God, I thank you, God. What I wondered is if we split into two groups, and it's, only, it's literally just for five minutes to pray for each other. And I felt, you know, the river being the boundary for north and south, and that does leave the eastern as sort of you can just choose which way. But if you're a north of the river person or a south of the river person, oh dear. Anyway, it just seems to be a natural way to divide things. The southerners, we're just going to head off into the next room. We're going to pray for each other. And the reason we do it is you just might meet someone who lives a block away or two blocks away and you go, wow, you're just up the road. Because in our heart for small connection points, especially when revival comes, you're going to have to need an accountable base, a ministry base. You just might meet a few people who are living close to you. So anyone who'd like to do that, south of the river, we're heading off next door. And the northerners can stay here and I'm going to ask Glenn and Isabel to help. It's a bit like definition of impossible, isn't it? I don't know what's going to happen, but anyway, you can try. And if there's anyone really cranky because you don't live north or south, you live I'm east or I'm west, then uh, offer forgiveness. It's a transaction legally. <laughs> Secondly, it's an emotional thing that you'll get over before long. Number three, don't make a judgment. Otherwise, you'll always have a problem with those who live north and south. So come on, Southerners, let's go. And we're just going to pray for each other.